Now we have Tropical Storm Beta. So if I were talking to Chrissy Teigen and she were asking me, hey, do I need to be concerned? I would say, you know, Good morning and welcome to another day in the life. Today we're gonna to be doing endo and uh, I'm really excited about it to be honest with you because it's another day in the life. The last time I filmed one was not that long ago and it was during a, well, a hurricane warning. Thankfully the hurricane didn't hit. Now we have Tropical Storm Beta. We've since moved through the entire alphabet of named storms and are now in the Greek alphabet. So we've had alpha already, now beta. I am shooketh by the number of storms we've had these past three years. It is a little frightening. So uh, today it is 6.58, actually a little bit later to work than usual. Usually that's fine. Everybody drives a little bit slower. So patients get here a little bit later. Surgeons get here a little bit later. It's kind of like, all right, understandable. We're in the middle of a tropical storm. Don't worry about it, you know, if you're a few minutes late. But I don't like to be late. So thankfully, I looked at the schedule online. I have like a secure app that we use for billing and scheduling purposes. And it looks like, unless there are some last minute changes, I don't have cases till eight o'clock. So I'm actually early. What did I do this morning already? It's 6.58 and I've already made dinner. Slow cooker pot roast. Oh, and I'm wearing this because I want to see some rainbows after this rain. Um, slow cooker pot roast. I will link my recipe down below. I'm gonna work on the recipe during my downtime today between cases. I brought my laptop. So I will link that down below. It should be available by the time you're watching this. And um, so I am gonna cook it on low for 10 hours. 10 hours is the length of my shift. The I love my slow cooker. I will link that in my in my blog post as well. If you need a slow cooker, this is so good. It doesn't have like fancy Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but I don't really care about that. I just set it and forget it. It's on low for 10 hours. My shift is 10 hours. Because of the tropical storm, they tend to be, um, my leadership tends to be a little bit more forgiving about letting you go early, like when your cases are done, instead of hanging around. Because I am just a shift worker like anybody else. Like, I get dismissed. I don't like just leave when I want to. So, but tends to be that they're like, all right, you know, it's flooding. School's canceled today for Harper. Um, <laughs> she's had more canceled and virtual days than she has had in person. By the way, in-person learning has been going very well. Uh, you guys want to know my opinion about it? Well, now you know, my child is in school, in in-person school. That's how I feel about it. But I would say you really need to gauge it upon your child and your school. I think we felt 100%, not 100%, but we felt the most confident with Harper's school that they were gonna do everything in their power to to protect the kids and the teachers. And so it, um, they had the resources to do that. You know, all in all, I think it's really great. It's been amazing for her. She's only been like a week and a half-ish and already she's just blossomed. She's lit up. She's like a firecracker. She's so energized. She's just talking even more. And um, it's just been a really amazing for her. And you just can't get that with remote learning. So the socialization is the main aspect that we wanted for, for her. School is canceled, so they're gonna switch to pivot to remote learning. I am going to finish this coffee in the next 30 seconds turn this ember mug off it's so funny I bring this heated mug with me and then I finish it because I don't want to take it inside I finish it in my car so I like really don't even need it to be heated because it's too hot still that's okay all right time to take out my teeny tiny umbrella look at this thing oh my god it's so cute I also have my fanny pack this is my psychedelic fanny pack that I wear in the OR. So I have my N95, an Apple pencil for some reason, an extra pen, some tissues, and hand sanitizer. And I've done my screening questions for the hospital already. So I just show them what I'm working with. Show them what you're working with. All right, let's go. While I'm in endo here, um, it's about 8.12 and I've already seen the first patients for the day. One of them is a bronchoscopy patient. And if you didn't know, some endoscopy centers like mine that I work at um, also do bronchoscopies. So um, that means that instead of having a, a scope, which is a camera and a long flexible tube go down your throat or up your bottom, 
um, it goes into your airway and uh, pulmonologists can use the information to take biopsies, to clean out people whose lungs get infected or get um, clogged very easily. And um, it's usually done, in, well, it's almost always done under general anesthesia. So I've seen a patient today who's gonna have a bronchoscopy. One of, oh, we have a couple of bronchs actually today. And one of them, uh, this uh, first patient has a mass that was found on a CT scan after um, she went to her primary doctor for this chronic cough that wouldn't go away. They ended up doing an x-ray and then a CT scan and it showed that there's a mass that's um, very central kind of to the respiratory tree and the, the large bronchi. So it's gonna be accessible with a bronchoscopy and we use an ultrasound, special ultrasound probe, ultrasound bronch probe that can actually locate that mass um, using ultrasound and camera and then they can take little biopsy pieces of it which is really interesting. They send it off to pathology while the patient's still asleep, verify that the sample they have is an adequate sample and then we wake the patient up. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. While I'm here, I have my computer. I'm waiting for the cases to roll back to get started. And uh, I thought I would share with you today's video sponsor. Today's sponsor is NordVPN. Now you guys know I completely 100% recommend using a VPN wherever you are on all of your devices. The reason for this is because public Wi-Fi is not secure. So anybody can track what your accessing what content you're you're looking at what information and communications you are sending and transmitting whenever you're hooked up to a public wi-fi that's airports that's school that's work that's pretty much everywhere you kind of work on the or go on a daily basis so definitely use a vpn no matter what i really like nord vpn and i've recently switched to them because they are kind of the biggest and most well-known vpn out there and i would say that um, their prices are really competitive and they offer all of the wonderful benefits of a vpn plus security protecting you from the dark web but basically it provides you with access so you can access Netflix from different countries. You can make yourself, your internet traffic look like you are in a different country than you are. This also helps with achieving discounts on travel and then online security. So you're just making sure that you're not being hacked, that your employer or school or airport people are not accessing your information simply because your phone or your computer is connected to public Wi-Fi. So it's really, really important. It's also useful even at home. So like I said, using Netflix or using different websites to look like you're coming from a different place will help you access, uh, for example, TV shows that are only available in, in America or TV shows that are only available in the UK, for example. Um, that goes for other streaming services, not just Netflix. If you are a student and you often like to, well, in a non-pandemic world, like to study at libraries or internet or cafes or Starbucks, the, you, you're utilizing a public Wi-Fi for that, you definitely want to use a VPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash Christina Brawley. That's nordvpn.com slash Christina Brawley. Or you can enter Christina Brawley at checkout to get your discount. This discount is huge and you cannot get it anywhere else except using my code. One o'clock-ish, a little bit past one o'clock, and I'm eating lunch. It's like a burrito bowl type thing. Raining cats and dogs out there. Did I mention that it's a tropical storm? I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm always filming these episodes during a tropical storm. <laughs> There's gotta be something I can mess this on. Here we go. Here we go. So we've seen, I've seen probably about, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 patients really not that much it's not a very busy day but um i think that might have something to do with still recovering from the pandemic and getting our census back up but also the tropical storm so it's like flooding and some people have rescheduled and we don't worry about flooding we're just you know we just show up for work and we just take care of whoever needs taken care of and that's that so i only have one more patient to see it's another bronchoscopy this one is going to be tb isolation what that means is we uh, utilize a negative pressure room, we have the patient under general anesthesia, and everyone wears an N95. This is, outside of a pandemic, this is the only reason we would ever really wear an N95 during a procedure is because of a concern for TB, which is an airborne isolation precaution. Um, now, we're very used to wearing N95s during all respiratory procedures and all anesthetics because of coronavirus, 
Um, although stuff has come out now, new data suggests that it really doesn't aerosolize as easily as people thought. And I've said all along, the only way it probably even aerosolizes is because of something we do. So um, possibly nebulizing procedure, nebulizing treatments, but mostly just what I do for a living, which is intubation. So I would imagine that's kind of like the main reason. Like, and a bronch, of course, would be highly aerosol producing because you're sitting there and putting, injecting air and saline and probes and stuff inside of the respiratory tree. And that is just, things are gonna aerosolize. Think of a spray can. I've used that analogy in that before, but think of a like a, a spray can of something. That's what we have left. I'm waiting for the patient to get here. They will get their IV. They will fill out a preoperative questionnaire that relates to anesthesia and their medical history. And then I go over that with them and I cover all of the basic high points. I ask them, I kind of run through what they can expect from the anesthetic so that they make sure that they're well informed. And then I ask them if they have any questions about anything related to today and doesn't have to be anesthesia maybe there's a question I can answer for them that isn't anesthesia related and maybe I can make myself useful in that way and then we go back to the room we put the patient to sleep and um, they do the procedure and then we wake them up and take them to the recovery room and they hang out there for usually at least an hour for a bronch because it's general anesthesia but usually a little longer because they might want a breathing treatment ordered by the pulmonologist or the pulmonologist might order a chest x-ray so I'm gonna eat the rest of this food before it gets cold, and I'll see you in a little bit. I actually thought I would go ahead and go over some of the questions you asked in my last video, which was my Dr. J in the Life Pandemic Pregnant Hurricane Edition. Now it's Tropical Storm Beta Edition. So let's go ahead and answer some of your questions. So Michelle W asks, who decides if a female patient gets a pregnancy test? Is it routine or a case-by-case -case basis? I asked because Chrissy Teigen had implant surgery and now realized she was pregnant during her surgery. So this is a great question. Any woman of child, the answer is, short answer is, before any anesthetic, any woman of childbearing age should have a pregnancy test. The only exceptions to that are like far postmenopausal, um, if they've had a hysterectomy, in most cases if they've had their tubes tied, the facility will allow for you to bypass a pregnancy test. But other than that, you're gonna get a pregnancy test. Like I think some places start as early as 13. The reason for this is because some of the the different medications that we give during an anesthetic could be potentially harmful for a developing fetus or could cause uh, abnormalities, growth abnormalities, limb abnormalities, birth defects. Not to say that any of these things are dangerous, but there's just, it's just one of those situations where you don't want to mess around with that. You don't want to take a chance. There's a chance that nothing would go wrong, but why, ex again, as I've mentioned in so many different cases, why expose anybody to something that they don't need to be exposed to. So <clears throat> it does mean that if you're pregnant and you undergo an anesthetic that, and you don't know you're pregnant and the team doesn't know you're pregnant, there is always a, a higher risk that you're going to have a, an abnormality. But in my expert opinion, I think a single one-time exposure is very unlikely to cause any major significant problems. So if I were talking to Chrissy Teigen and she were asking me, hey, do I need to be concerned? I would say, you know, I would just follow up with your ob doctor, look at those anatomy scans, make sure um, just as you would ordinarily without any known exposure, it would be something to discuss with her obstetrician and just ma make sure that everyone's on the same page. Yeah, hey, I had this anesthetic before we knew we were pregnant uh, and just go from there. But I wouldn't I wouldn't obsess over it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry myself too much about it. What's done is done. And most of the time, a single one-time dose is not enough to affect a de major developmental change in a growing fetus. Um, now, if it were something where, for example, it was a habitual occurrence, like someone was having an anesthetic every single week because of a medical condition, or it was a very long exposure, let's say they had like a 12 hour surgery, I'd be a little bit more concerned. But that's what I would say to Chrissy Teigen if she approached me with that kind of question. Someone asked, how often do you do bariatric surgery on patients with heart failure or EF of lower than 25%? Is it more likely to be denied or is it possible to do it? That's a great question. The, the bottom line is, although, and I mentioned this before in my last video about this, bariatric surgery, although life-saving is not 
emergent, it's not urgent. So typically what I would probably say with an, with an ejection fraction, which means a heart that should be 65% functioning is now 25%. So heart failure by definition, you're at a higher risk for not only complications under anesthesia, but also arrhythmias and problems with uh, the heart uh, going into a, a life-threatening rhythm while you're under anesthesia, or even just heck, just walking around. So as you get that lower ejection fraction, they become more and more at risk. And I would probably postpone the surgery to see if they could be better optimized. It might be medication, it might be additional weight loss using diet and exercise, which um, obviously I know that's why they're there because they're unable to get to their goal weight using just diet and exercise alone. But um, the surgery itself is a pretty major surgery and I don't think people realize this as much. It's a very stimulating surgery. They have to be pretty deep under anesthesia, which means I have to give a higher dose of an anesthetic, if that makes sense, which has a direct depressant effect on the heart. I've mentioned several times that anesthesia lowers blood pressure. It does that because it directly um, is suppressing your heart function. So that's why we're so concerned with you having a healthy heart or um, understanding what condition your heart is in so that we know how much we can give you without killing you. So I would say, if at all possible, but hold off on any elective procedures. I know it doesn't seem like it's an elective procedure, but when I say that, I just mean non-emergent. All elective procedures are non-emergent or non-urgent procedures. So I would say hold off until you can get that medically optimized. It might be, it might be being on some fluid pills, some water pills, some diuretics. It might be, um, there are some great heart failure medications out there that your doctor might want to put you on. Um, and yeah, go from there. But I would say just walking in the front door ready to have surgery, no, anesthesiologist will probably be like, you know what? Let's just take a pause, figure out what we're doing here. Why are we doing this right now? Why do this now when we can optimize you better? Now, if someone said to me, I got denied last time, I'm still EF 25%, my doctor has said and gave me a note, here you go, it says that I have optimized, been optimized as much as I possibly can, and that might be like a powwow situation with the surgeon, with the cardiologist, with the patient, just all discussing and kind of a round table discussion of what, does everybody understand what the risks are? And we know what the benefits are. Losing the weight can actually eventually improve the heart function so shedding all that weight can be good for the heart but they have to make it through the surgery first does that make sense so that's that's a very tricky question oh here's a great question do you feel regional anesthesia is safe um anna kohler asks blocks for foot and ankle or shoulder shoulder surgeries i'm scared of nerve damage but i don't want to be in excruciating pain for the first few days um, she said she got lost on the internet and found herself reading a story of someone who got a popliteal block and not sure if they didn't use ultrasound for it or what, but they injected local into her circulatory system and she ended up going into cardiac arrest. L luckily it was at a hospital and there was a cardiac OR nearby and they saved her life. So great question. It, that is an extremely rare complication of a regional block, which is performed by an anesthesiologist. It's an injection of numbing medicine around a bundle of nerves that go to one of your extremities. So in your neck to go to your shoulder, in your shoulder to go to your arm, in your groin to go to your knee, or in your knee to go to your foot. So it's kind of like, think of it as like injecting something upstream of the river and it takes it down and it blocks everything from that point down. I always tell people there are risks and what you're signing on your consent form is a risk of knowing that you could have a seizure, you could have cardiac collapse, and that would happen by directly injecting local anesthetic into a blood vessel. But get this, this can happen at the dentist's office in the gums. It can be absorbed if they don't use the right type of medication or they don't use um, epinephrine in their medication or something like that that helps constrict blood vessels, they can inject it into a blood vessel or it can be rapidly absorbed. Any other situation like in surgery, what they'll do is they'll tell me when the surgeon will sit, will look at me and tell me I'm gonna inject now and I look at the EKG while they're doing that. So I'm watching because I wanna see if there are any cardiovascular changes. I said, whoa, 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 stop, you know. I've seen that once or twice and I'm like, hold up. <laughs> I don't think that you are in the right place or it's um, injecting into the skin or sub-Q, but they might, I mean, it would be like, just completely by chance that it happens to be in a blood vessel. It's possible to accidentally think if you're not t well trained or even the best of us could, could mistake blood vessel for a nerve and inject numbing medicine in, in or around it. And that is a serious complication. It's one I've thankfully never witnessed, never had happen to me. 
because there are ways to verify if what you're looking at is a vein or if it's a blood vessel. So basically it just comes down to experience and training and I'm being careful. So we always draw back on the syringe before we inject to see if we get blood back. And if we get blood back, that's probably not a good sign. Yes, that can happen. Yes, it is very scary. Yes, uh, we do have protocols and procedures in place, but if you're not in a hospital, it is not good. Now there's something called intralipid, which every regional anesthesiologist should have on hand whenever they're doing a nerve block, and that is basically this milky white substance that acts as like a reservoir for local anesthetic. You, it gets pumped throughout the bloodstream, through the IV, and it basically sucks up like a vacuum all the local anesthetic that's circulating. It doesn't take what's already affected the heart out, but everything that's still there and still affecting the heart on like a long term basis will will get taken out but yeah it's very scary and something i wouldn't wish on anybody but you just have to understand the risks and understand that the risk is extremely low it's very uncommon it's so uncommon that when it happens somebody writes a story about it does that make sense like it's just not a commonplace occurrence very effective procedure and it's so helpful for especially orthopedic procedures um controlling your pain afterwards. The difference, I've had patients who've gotten one shoulder done and one shoulder done without, um, one with a regional block and one without, and they say the difference is night and day. The recovery is so much better. They don't have side effects from the pain medication like nausea and constipation and uh, like just drowsiness and everything. So that it's just a, such a nice thing to be able to offer a patient. So yeah, anyway, uh, that's that for our little mini Q&A session. I hope you enjoy that. Ooh. Oh, this is slogging. Uh -huh. Can you focus? No. I'll see you in the car. All right, got in the car and I was able to like defog this camera. It is just shy of five o'clock and I am done for the day. Oh, goodness. Whew. Feeling more and more pregnant every single day. So what a, what a great day, but unfortunately for you guys, not very exciting. Um, boring day, slow day, but just what one needs when you are worried about your loved ones at home. So not too, not too upset about having a slow day every once in a while. Um, I got a lot of work done. So I find on these slow days, I look at the schedule, I'm in endo, I'm supervising. I have to kind of hang out in the area anyway. So I get some work done, I bring my laptop. I've like almost completely redesigned my, well I redesigned my website over the weekend on last Friday, but I've been going through the recipes and like updating this like recipe plugin. So if you go to my website, you want to revisit some of my websites, there's a category tab drop down that you can click on and click on food and recipes and I have I am I have I have outdone myself <laughs> I'm like this is taking me all day but it is really really nice and oh update for follow me on Instagram stories I singed my eyelashes on the right side this weekend by trying to light my outdoor fireplace I went <laughs> you know with the gas that was fun so I'm getting those fixed on Thursday Trisha's gonna come over. Relatively dry, not dry, it's not dry right now, but it's just sprinkling and it has been alternating like pouring and sprinkling and right now it's in a sprinkle mode so I'm gonna like try and hit the road because this is a good time to go. And then I wanna get Harper's nanny out so she can get home safely as well. Uh, this tropical storm is just real slow and it's just dumping a whole bunch of water sort of a la Harvey. I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as Harvey obviously, but. Um, Harvey was like, it dumped to like 30 inches of rain in like two days or something, it's crazy. I wonder how many inches of rain we've accumulated since beta hit us. Mm -hmm.